Любопытная деталь. Uh, Curious detail here. Have a look. Behind me you can see boots with laces tied, tossed over electric wires. It means that this district is under the protection of a gang that manages the area. You can't just come here, really. When we arrived, we were asked to stay in the car. Our attendant went to talk to particular people. Only after this were we greeted and allowed to come in. Today I will show you how people live in a country where you should only walk the street holding things you are ready to give away to folks with guns, who will surely find you sooner rather than later. Today we will visit the most terrifying districts where 30 people shot per day is kind of normal. Most of the crimes happen in these districts. Robbery, murders, kidnapping. We will also pay a visit to the local Upper East Side. Huge golf fields, and they are not empty, unlike shelves in the shops. We will find out why a portion of fries in McDonald's costs $130. When you eat these fries, you're getting from time to time this stuff, which is unchewable. It tastes kind of like wood. We will also visit the Venezuelan carnival. Venezuela is an amazing country because a full tank of gas costs around 8 cents, whereas toilet paper is $8.42. Venezuela is an amazing country because it has one of the richest oil reserves in the world, yet the income level per capita hardly climbs over $10. By the way, I was really lucky with the drone shooting because now in Venezuela, you can really go to jail if you're caught flying one. Recently, there was an assassination attempt on Maduro. A drone flew as close to him as possible and then exploded. Since then, anyone with the drone has been arrested. That's why I'm sincerely grateful to our cameraman. By the way, people, at the end of the video, I will run a contest with prizes that I've personally brought from South America. A collectible bottle of rum, one bolivar that is super hard to find now, and I will say why. My name is Leodov, and you know me from the People channel. Now I will show how people live in the most unusual places on the planet. Subscribe and like the channel right now. This is our program, How People Live. For the second year in a row, analytics company Gallup has been listing Venezuela amongst the most dangerous countries in the world. The number of murders per 100,000 citizens is 81.4. If someone stops you and demands money or something else, just silently raise your hands and give him all you have. I heard it's better not to look them in the eyes, because the number one rule is, if there's too much hassle and it's easier to shoot you, he will simply shoot you. These cases are hardly ever cracked. It's actually getting darker in the street now, and I'm walking with a phone in my pocket. No match to holding camera on the head level. Like, who would even notice? You probably shouldn't do that. On my way from the airport, I was told that recently, a couple of days before my arrival, a Russian was attacked. He was just walking to the shop, not suspecting any threat. He tried to resist and was eventually hit in the forehead with the butt of a gun. As a result, brain concussion, and all the money he had was stolen. Another story happened to a delegation going by car. They were stopped at the traffic light, and while the criminals were trying to take off the wedding ring, apparently gold, they broke the man's finger. The main type of transport in the Venezuelan barriers are motorbikes. Small houses in the street are built as close as possible. Traditionally, most of the crimes happen exactly in these districts. Robbery, murders, kidnapping. The situation is so drastic that a couple of years ago, Venezuelan military were ordered not to drive in the nighttime because the robbers would hunt them to get a free load of Kalashnikovs. The same order instructed the military not to use mobile phones when standing at traffic lights during the daytime. Actually, traffic robbery is typical not only for Venezuela, but for all of Latin America, especially for Brazil. Tourists usually go to the local favelas with attendants and for cash. For example, in the Petare district, 30 killed over the weekend is around normal. This is how a typical shooting in a Venezuelan favela looks. One group is on the roof, a guy falls after a gunshot. 
Another one is hiding behind the corner of a house. For you to see how habitual such a mess is for the locals, have a look at the guy in shorts. First he runs around with a gun, then he gets tired, comes over to his house, has a relaxed chat with his wife, then simply takes the plate to eat some porridge, and apparently waits for the police. Most of the killings in the barrio result from the fights amongst local gangs, so the police don't even bother. I heard you can rent a revolver here for $60 per day, but judging by the situation, I don't really trust these numbers. I think it's much cheaper. Other districts are pretty peaceful in the daytime. The center of Caracas doesn't look like a district in the world's most dangerous city at all, though statistically, Caracas does top the list. A couple of kiosks with ice cream, but people live in, to put it mildly, simpler conditions. Look how I live. I have a cable TV here. We don't have electricity now, but we're waiting for it to be switched on. Really, there's a TV under a shelf with watermelons, plus a couple of suitcases on the counter. This is my kitchen. Here I cook a bit, mainly something fast. He washes in this barrel, but there is no water now, as well as electricity. So there is a candle on a shelf, most probably from the church. Showering here is actually complicated. In 2009, Hugo Chavez, ex-president of Venezuela, forbade people from showering for more than three minutes. There are people who need to wait for the water to heat up. Why? What for? So they switch on water and let it run? Drinking water? Every minute of it is a criminal act. One minute for soap, one for shampoo, one to finish up. I counted three minutes and I don't stink. Until now, you can't always get hot water and not everywhere. And now five seconds for you, friends, to guess how much this man earns per month. Three dollars, thirty, hundred and thirty, or three hundred dollars? You know, I travel a lot and I visit many places which are not supposed to be for tourists and this is why sometimes I live in the conditions like this which are more or less the same to the guy that you just saw. And sometimes I don't even have like three minutes like Mr. Chavez for the shower. And in this case, the only way for me not to stink and to be clean and to be ready for anything in my trips is Manscaped. Manscaped created the world's first all-in-one manscaping kit that makes manscaping safe and easy. To be honest, I'm excited to be one of the first to receive the low mower water-resistant body trimmer, the only trimmer on the market made with advanced skin-safe technology, which reduces nicks and cuts from manscaping accidents. It's got a powerful 7000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology, premium 90-minute battery with rapid charging dock powered by USB, cordless and water-resistant, which makes it perfect for trimming in the shower. Plus, for a limited time you get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. When you purchase the new Perfect Package 3.0 kit online at manscaped.com, you also get a replacement blade refill for your lawn mower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. Get 20% off plus free shipping plus two free gifts when you purchase the new Perfect Package 3.0 kit with my code PEOPLE20 at manscaped.com. There's a link in the description to get Manscaped products, so please follow and don't think even if you have a show which lasts three minutes or less. A million bolivars. The owner of the shop is my brother. My duties include security. I help as an unskilled laborer. A million bolivars is almost $300, which is a crazy amount of salary for Venezuela. Honestly, I didn't even believe it at first, but our guide assured us that this is a central fruit store and the numbers look real. Despite the crisis in this country, there are almost all the biggest American chains here. For example, Wendy's. I personally love burgers there, better than in Mackie D's or Burger King. Shame Wendy's closed in Moscow. There's also Pizza Hut. And I'm not only talking about the capital. For example, here's a Burger King in San Cristobal, a town with a population of 300,000 people. It is on the border with Colombia. There is literally no one here. I really don't get how come this Burger King operates at all? One burger here costs around $7, so you can buy one and a half burger for a monthly pay. There is not a single soul here. And what's curious, the kitchen doesn't work either. It works somehow partially. I mean, I come and they promise that they will make me a burger. At the same time, they don't have any intermediate products for burgers, like there are no buns, no potatoes, there's no salad for sale. There he is, the only person I saw in Burger King except for us for three days that we've been staying in a hotel nearby. And guess what he's eating? What he brought with him in a container. It appeared to be a local employee. What's funny is they've actually built the shit for queuing. They found it somewhere, placed an order. It's not that simple here in Venezuela. They spent money. 
So please, line up everyone. A lunch for three people cost us around $40, $13 per person. Very expensive. Fast food in Venezuela is generally very expensive. For example, my dinner at McDonald's. Yes, in order to stay chubby, I eat dinner at McDonald's. Always honest with you guys. A combo with burger that looks like a classic Big Mac. The original Big Mac was withdrawn from sales because it's impossible to produce here. The central bun that separates two Big Mac meat patties. This dinner costs 24,000 by three equals eight. Eight dollars. Let's see what kind of Big Mac that is. Well, you know, it's okay. I thought it could be a lot worse, especially taking into account what I've been eating before in this wonderful country. Not bad at all. Very similar to a Big Mac. A Big Mac costs 14,000 bolivars if you buy it separately, a bit more than $3. Venezuelan Big Mac costs two times more than in Russia. As for the fries, it's an interesting thing and it's really different. Why? Because it's not potatoes. The thing is, potatoes in Venezuela are extremely expensive, almost $2 for a kilo. The so-called fried potatoes are made of a root plant called yucca. The taste is kind of similar. Of course, you sense something different, but generally it's similar. Venezuelan McDonald's once calculated that if they used real potatoes, then one portion would have cost $133 US. It is generally impossible to understand the prices in Venezuela. For example, in the lobby of our hotel, one shot of whiskey costs $58. One shot, not a bottle. No surprise, alcohol in the bars is protected even from staff by measuring tapes so that they don't overpour it or pour it off for resale. It is more expensive to eat to the food court here than in a restaurant. For example, a venue attended by all the embassy employees, it looks very expensive. A piece of meat is around $10. At the entrance, you are greeted by a bottle of vodka from Roberto Cavalli for a crazy 30 bucks, three months salary. There's also a sign asking to take your gun out before entering the restaurant. Before 2012, guns were sold here like mangoes, literally on every street corner. New laws allow only the sale of guns to military, police, or employees of the security services. But since the adoption of the law, the number of guns amongst the civil population has skyrocketed from three to almost six million. Most of the weapons, of course, end up in the arms of criminals. Venezuelan mafia clans network today looks as follows. There are five types of gangs. The first one is colectivos, the guys on motorbikes. They usually control the districts that are dangerous for ordinary policemen. Politically, they are supporting the ruling regime. The second type of gangs are the so-called pranes. Prane is a slang word for a leader managing the gang from behind the bars. They collect common money by robbing people on the streets as well as in the gold mining areas. People there earn relatively well compared to the rest of the country. The third gangs are the so-called Las Magabandas. This is the most qualified gang. They do not only do robbery, but also securities fraud. The fighters, by the way, have access to military weapons. Fourth type of gangs are paramilitaries, half military organizations that operate at the border with Colombia, especially involved in smuggling. The fifth gang are ex-members of the National Liberation Army. They fight in the woods with TNT and rifles, the ideas of Marx, Lenin, and Bolivar. Venezuelan favelas are called barrio, which means district in Spanish. But the point is that these are the poorest areas, literally slums. They grew on the cheapest land in Caracas, hills and uplands. Till today, only the poorest live here. These are the areas where monthly salary barely reaches $10. So financially, all is down. That's how the locals meet up. A shabby box with small gates where guys are playing football. Basically, Barrio is a town with half a million people squeezed into the area of two or three districts of a typical Russian city. The higher you climb, the narrower the streets are. In some places, paths turn into stairs, a space for only a couple of people. Barrio started to form already in the first half of the 20th century, after the fall of food prices. From 1939 until today, agriculture remains a financially unprofitable activity, so the former farmers have nothing to do but to relocate closer to the city to get any job. Naturally, there's never been any issue with permission 
in to build huts, one on top of another, but nobody really asked. People just look at the bricks and did the job. That's how it looks inside. No wallpaper, stone walls, painted at best, cloth curtains instead of doors. The rooms are tiny, so there is space only for a bed, basically. Wardrobes and dresses are not popular around here. People just store things in plastic bags. No heating. Thank God, in Venezuela, the temperature rises up to 122 Fahrenheit, even in February. Holes in the walls don't seem to bother anyone either. The roof is simply a steel sheet. Most importantly, it must protect from rain and hold in place. The wind here is really strong. This woman's name is Luisa Ana Gonzalia. She is a dance teacher and a nail technician. She earns 50,000 bolivars or $14 per month. She received a flat in a new house closer to the city center under the resettlement program. The hut is too small for three kids. She still visits Barrio often and is proud to have water and gas in the kitchen because when her father was building the house, none of this was available. We've built this house slowly, brick by brick. I wasn't born yet back then and now I'm already pushing 35. Each barrio has its own beholder, who reports to the seniors in his gang, not to the police. These laws are learnt here from childhood. The easiest, and maybe the only way to become rich in the barrio, is to become a criminal. Folks don't really see any upward mobility, nor chances to get legal income. Check this interview with one of the gang leaders. Well, we do a little bit of everything. Drugs, kidnapping, stealing cars, killing for money, like him, you know. Mostly drugs. Do you bother about the police? No, I have good contacts. In my case, life is better now than in the past. But I reckon people of the city are having a hard time. Last year was the worst year in the history of Venezuela. I don't know why. Maybe it's the economy. I've already mentioned that Venezuela is one of the richest countries when it comes to oil. And now, three seconds for you to guess which place Venezuela holds in the top 10 list of countries with the biggest oil reserves. Is it the 10th, the 7th, the 5th, or the 1st? According to the World Factbook by CIA, Venezuela has the biggest oil reserves in the world. There's more golden black liquid here than in Saudi Arabia that look like this. Also more than in Russia, but we can refrain from pictures here. So what happened? Only 20 years ago, the situation in Venezuela was a lot better. In 1999, maybe the most charismatic leader of the last century came to power, Hugo Chavez. His speeches were flamboyant and extravagant. Once he was holding the floor for 11 hours in a row. Imagine that. At the same time, Chavez hated America and shook hands with everyone against the USA. Chavez was once pissed that they shared the same time zone with New York. He literally said that Venezuela had to refuse the time imposed by the imperial regime and turn Venezuela's clocks back 30 minutes. Insane. Another time while giving a speech in the UN, he commented on George W. Bush, who took the floor a day before. Ayer estuvo el diablo aquí. Devil is here. En este mismo lugar. He was in this very spot only yesterday. It still smells like sulfur. The turning point for the Chavez government was in 2001, when oil prices started to grow. He nationalized the industrial facilities. So billions of dollars from oil sales started to flow to the country's budget instead of the US. He issued food subsidies, improved education, and started to build the healthcare system, which in turn led to a sharp drop of the poverty rate by more than a half. These programs first really helped the poor strata, but at the same time made people directly dependent on the oil prices. It was clear that the programs couldn't go on if the prices were to fall. It happened already after the death of Chavez. Oil prices around the globe dropped almost two times in six months. Many countries entered the crisis, and the government of Venezuela couldn't do anything to fix the situation. Consequently, the government couldn't cover the food subsidies for all of the poor, who by that time composed 82% of the population. Is it true that there's a limit in shops on how much one person can buy? This limit exists, and not only on the quantity of goods, but also on the days when you can buy them. When you come to the shop, they check the final number of your ID. For example, on Monday, one can buy food only if the last number is one or two. Tuesday is for those who have three or four, 
and so on. It happened to me several times that I came to buy something and they wouldn't sell it to me because my ID number ends with an 8. My day is Friday. So if you come on Tuesday, you can't buy anything. Only one day per week, right? Right, only one day per week. People start to queue since 5 a.m. So many have to ask for leaves at work. The government of several regions even legally forbid people from standing in the lines because it's not safe. Caracas gives an impression of the city with endless lines. People are queuing almost everywhere. From the mobile stores where people wait for half an hour, an hour, to top up their phone. You can't do it on the internet or any other way. The longest food line was filmed by the AP agency in January 2015. Endless zigzags. The typical queue is a bit shorter. In order to get this shattered counter wrapped with duct tape, yes, nobody cares about replacing the glass. People have to stand for hours. Even if I can't come on Friday and I can't buy five kilos of food, the rule says two kilos, that's what I get. What kind of products are you talking about, namely? I mean products under the government control. The prices are controlled by the government. It's rice, pasta, grits, corn flour, coffee, sugar, the main food products. And as I understand, the prices are also limited. Yes, that's why you can't buy it anyway. Speculators buy the products and resell them there behind the corner. But it's 10 times more expensive. A kilo of sugar costs $1.2. For comparison, a Russian grocery store, a kilo of sugar costs three times less. Pasta costs the same, $1. But you have to bring a bag to buy it. So a kilo of sugar is $1.20. In Russia, it's 50 cents. Wheat flour costs $1 in Russia, from 0.5 rubles, and so on. Is it true that people are paying with food now? For example, for car park? Yes, it's true. Yes, prices have risen sharply. Can we talk about the deficit of products in Venezuela? Answer for yourself. Write me a comment. Meanwhile, I will show you the situation the way it is. Here is a real empty shop with shabby shelves, rotten fridge with empty bottles. People still collect bottles here and deposit them. The only food sold in the shop are green bananas at an unbelievable price of more than $2 per kilo. It's 20% of the salary. Imagine if a kilo of bananas in New York cost $850. 10 minutes from here, there is a big supermarket with security at the entrance. Here, the shelves are stocked. Curious fact, there is no Sprite in Venezuela. It's called Chinato here. There's no Fanta, it's a local hit. Coca-Cola is sold, but the word itself means basically any sweet sparkling beverage. The word is denominative. Actually, since nobody really cares about the copyright violations, there is a lot of fake Pepsi and Coca-Cola. These beverages are not the same and taste horrible. As for the real Coke, a two litre bottle is extremely expensive, $2.70, 25% of local salary. Honestly, I thought the prices in Russia are the fastest growing, but it appears that's not really the case. It's not that I'm so happy about comparison with Venezuela, but in 2018, prices here rose by 6,000% in a year. At some point, the government tried to follow the prices. In 2012, there was formed an equitable price committee that was supposed to oversee the evil capitalist businessmen and prevent unfair ripoff of the population. Maduro once got pissed that a dishwashing machine cost $8,000. So he sent the military to the shop, who set the price 10 times lower. People rushed to buy out the whole stock, while such big players as General Motors, Toyota and Ford left the market. But automobile and oil tycoons are next to nothing in Venezuela, compared to those who, drum roll, produce toilet paper. No jokes, really. It is a pure luxury, only affordable by the very rich. One roll of toilet paper costs 21,000 bolivars. If we divide that by three, we will get $7 per such roll. For one month's salary, you can buy one such roll. 70% from the salary in New York, this roll would have cost $3,000. There is a meme in Venezuelan social networks recently. It also appears in ours. The Venezuelan military were awarded with toilet paper. Now I understand that it's not funny, and it's actually true. Paper deficit in the country reached such a scale that the government extended all passport terms by two years because they simply didn't have enough paper or ink to print new ones. In September 2013, the BBC reported that the National Guard took by force a private paper cellulose factory to avoid the total deficit. People save on paper even when it comes to napkins. Show the napkins. <laughs> it's like they cut a newspaper. What is it even? It's like the one used to print newspapers. They just cut it, but you can't really use it. You know, I, I think even back in the USSR, the paper we had was better adapted and to interact with skin. This one is all glossy. It doesn't soak anything up. It looks a bit of a mockery. 
Eventually, it got to the point where a rectangular piece of paper to print banknotes was more expensive than the banknote value. It simply became unprofitable to print money, especially taking into account the sky-high levels of inflation. For example, last year the inflation rate reached 1,300,000%, so the money was now easier to weigh rather than to count. This wad of cash was paid in summer 2018 for a whole chicken, a bit less for a kilo of carrots. That's a bunch to buy our favourite toilet paper. The government implemented currency redenomination and cut five zeros, so a million bolivars turned into ten. So today, fewer banknotes are printed. Plus, people started using debit cards. Still, Visa or MasterCard are not accepted anywhere. You'll hardly find a single place accepting cards out of the capital. We had a day at the border when we couldn't eat at all because we ran out of local money and nobody accepted neither dollars in cash nor cards. Since then, any shop accepting cards was a little bit of heaven for me. If you pay by card, you'll be asked to enter the number of your internal ID. At first, we tried to explain that we're foreigners and we don't have internal IDs, but eventually started to enter random seven-digit numbers. It's a lot easier. Before you leave the shop, a special man will check your bag to make sure you've paid for all you have. Then he'll stamp your bill. By the way, paper bills are a sign of a rich shop. There is a huge supermarket and not even in, haven't seen such even in some of our cities. The system is usual. You take fruit, for example mango, put it into a bag and then weigh it on a scale that looks like this. Naturally, there are no stickers indicating weight. One such paper sticker will be more expensive than all the mangoes I've picked. As for meat, you can buy it on the market. Here are some funny folks carrying half a cow. There are no trolleys, so they have to run around with 50 kilo carcasses on a shoulder. In this section, you can buy chicken, rooster, and attention, pigeons. Sacrifice cults are very popular in Venezuela, and pigeons are used exactly for this purpose. Today, the poor not only eat pigeons, but even hunt the street animals. Here is a person carving, most probably a cat. At the same time, you can't say that there is no meat in the shops. Please, even a small shop has a fridge with a huge bulk of ham. But the prices are crazy. 37 bucks for a piece. Who could possibly buy it earning $10 per month? Also, every shop, cafe and restaurant here has its own dollar rate set by the owner. Having dollars is complicated, and if you arrive with only a card and without cash, you are fucked, for lack of a better word. You can withdraw only 1500 bolivars per day, or 50 cents. Plus, you have to survive in a line like this. The thing is, there is no such thing in Venezuela as dollar rate. There is an official rate. The government at one point decided that one dollar must be equal to 10 bolivars. But this rate is only available for those in the government officially, to import medicine and food. Common people can't exchange dollars at all since 2013. Since 2003, one has to obtain a permission from the government to exchange currency, and only if the purpose is for travelling or study. You have to gather a set of documents, a return ticket, confirmation of the purpose of stay. This set is gathered following very strict rules up to the choice of folder colour. You need to also have a credit card, which here will take you about three years to obtain. The card also has to be issued not less than six months before application. A jury gathers and decides if you can exchange bolivars to dollars or not. Naturally, these vouchers were resold, which in turn spawned fraud and corruption. There is a dollar black market that shows the real cost of Bolivar. It is hundreds of times less than the one set by the government. Authenticity of dollar banknotes is strictly supervised. For example, if you pay cash when checking into a hotel, your banknotes will be copied and you will be asked to sign the copy. Looks really funny. If you give them fake money, they will find you an exact retribution? Yeah, sure. Dollar rate on the black market is, obviously, not coming from the central bank. It's a separate world. I don't understand what these people are thinking about. The rate comes from the Instagram accounts. Here is one of the most popular ones. The rate fluctuates all the time and drastically. So people, now you finally understand why the Bolivar dollar rate is such a mess. And now the promised contest. We don't have any super prizes, beamers or mercs, but at least all is fair. This is what I brought from this amazing country. By the way, I was supposed to bring a box of fruit from Venezuela, papaya, mango, stuff like that. It's been around two or three months already. Aeroflot is promising to bring it. I'm still waiting. It's not that I dream to share these fruits with you. I'm just curious. 
how it will look like after three months at plus 40. Back to business. The first place prize is a collection bottle of rum in a beautiful tissue bag. By the way, it's that rum that was carefully supervised with help of a measuring tape. The second prize is a one bolivar coin. It's a really unique prize. It's basically one ten thousandth of a dollar. You can hardly find one today, even in Venezuela. I've mentioned they're using cards now and all. So the third place prize is this bracelet in Venezuelan colors with a cute anchor at the end. As for the task people, the task is to guess as precisely as possible the rate of Bolivar to dollar exactly in two weeks. We will take the figures from the real Instagram page. Here it is, namely from the top stock, the Air TM. We will take the figures posted at 2 p.m. Venezuela time. Pay attention to the name of this Instagram page because there are fake accounts. The one we need is spelled as one word and the page has a million subscribers. So don't confuse them and subscribe to this channel right now to stay updated on future videos and of course, on the contest results. Moving on. There is a place in Caracas called basically the Upper East Side, rich area. There is an area with a large number of extremely expensive houses. We were just driving by and every house has a huge fence, just like in Russia. Here we also find huge, really massive golf courses. And see, they are not empty, unlike shelves in the shop. There is even barbed wire here. Look, why? You know, the problem is that there's no middle class here. There are many poor people here, and there are rich. I can say that there, there aren't too many. These people are stinking rich. Corruption in Venezuela is unbelievable. In order to get a passport, a place in a kindergarten and so on, you have to know someone who knows someone, who's friends with someone. That's the price list my Bloomberg colleagues got on WhatsApp. $4,500 to get a passport in two days. 400 bucks for a Chilean visa. From five to 7,000 to delete a criminal record. 100 for a stamp providing college diplomas. Corruption erodes even the most important parts of the system, built by Chavez. People line up to get a food package from the government. Well, I, I don't know. It depends. These packages cost 10, 20, 30 times cheaper than the shops. You mean cheaper than the speculator's price? Yes, yes. For example, last time the price of a package with milk, butter, pasta, grits, sugar and coffee was around 3 or 3,500 bolivars. One dollar? Yeah, yes. The problem is these free food packages reach fewer and fewer people each year. That's why communist Venezuelans have long been using the capitalist system to make money. Generally, despite the anti-American course of the government, people are quite loyal towards the US. The daughter of Chavez himself happily took selfies with Justin Bieber. Here's a guy on the street with a meat grinder. He will grind you as much coffee as you need. Street vendors sell what they can get, not what's in demand. Here's a man with a thermos who sells hot tea. Another one sells cigarettes, 200 bolivars each. He sits here for hours and even at lunchtime. Some guys like to chill, play chess and drink tea. The perfect job is a taxi driver. There is an army of them here. You can both chill between the rides and make some cash. Here we are in a Venezuelan taxi. Next to me is uh, the driver who looks like he's about 70. Buenos dias. Perfecto. He has a fantastic mirror. I'm not 100% sure what he's talking about. All Venezuelan taxis are equipped with cameras. Look, there really is a camera. Most probably it doesn't work. It monitors the cabin, doesn't monitor shit, and registers the fare of the driver. All money is siphoned off. There is a radio here and the taxi meter that doesn't work for some reason. Really, why would it? The point is that Maduro, the acting president, is trying to win more votes among taxi drivers. He started to give cars a discount price so the drivers could work, but under the condition that the fare would be socialistically small. They didn't quite observe that, but generally, somehow, it works. If you have a pickup truck but still want to work as a taxi driver, you're welcome. Here are six people packed into the back of a pickup. Standard practice. Here's a guy riding in an office chair. Our taxi driver, for example, got a flat tire. 
but he doesn't think about going for a service. He's finishing the ride. There are expensive cars in the city. They are kept behind tall fences with barbed wire. Most of the cars in the streets are old, shabby rattle traps. I saw two cars with a muffler literally dragging on the ground behind, and the drivers just kept on going. Doesn't look like it suddenly fell off, it's just normal to drive that way. Anyone who can get any car is a taxi driver. People torment their cars till they fall apart. Look, we're at a gas station. Gas costs six bolivars per litre. Full tank, around eight cents. Cheap petrol is kind of a socialist achievement since oil is national. So if you forgot to take your wallet, you can just come and ask to fill the tank for free. Most probably you won't be denied. Oh, and on the one hand, it's wonderful. On the other, despite enormous amounts of oil in the country, its production is rapidly going down because it requires technology, financing, and so on. Locals don't usually allow taxi rides, so they use buses. It's also almost free. A bus ticket costs 100 bolivars. We paid 100, didn't we? No matter where you go, right? So you pay 100 bolivars and go anywhere you need. No, not to another country. It's 1 13th of a dollar, around 3 cents. That's how the bus looks. There's no air conditioning, of course. The seats are fine, quite comfortable. The door is always open, because people are constantly jumping right to the bus. So it sometimes doesn't even stop, it just slows down, they jump on and the bus moves off. Today, the streets of Caracas are packed only in case of protests or during the carnival. <laughs> Venezuelan carnival is similar to our pancake week and the beginning of Great Lent. Children and some adults dress up, paint faces and go for a walk. If we turn a blind eye to the public disorder the carnival ended with this year, it's generally safe in the city at this time, criminally speaking. Carnival is classic for Latin America. But I should say that the Venezuelan one is very different from Jesus, someone just threw confetti right into my mouth. It's probably from the ground. See, all the floor is covered with these confetti. Well, not much you can do. Throwing confetti is a Venezuelan tradition, only there usually isn't money to buy new bags. That's how it's done, and then they kick the confetti around again. It's made of some really hard cardboard. Usually you're just walking the street, someone jumps up, pats you on the back, and throws a whole bunch of those things right into your face when you turn around. Well, those who throw it have fun, yeah, but honestly, it's not so pleasant. Still, the atmosphere is generally very cool. Actually, till 2013, Venezuela hosted lots of tourists, and before that, many people were dreaming to get here, and not only from Latin America, but also from the US. Things in Venezuela were so good that at one point they became the biggest consumers of whiskey in the world, and in the second half of the 70s, the country was the richest on the continent due to the income from oil sales. That's how a free city beach looks like now. It's a beach in Caracas. The saddest part is the infrastructure here is basically absent. The shore itself is quite clean, apparently because the water somehow managed to wash away all of this stuff. That's the only infrastructure you'll find here. There are the remains of canopies. There's one remaining there. Well, and before people could lie and relax in the shade, there are no changing rooms, so people change in the bushes. I'll turn now so you can see how people change. They just go to the side and do their thing. That's the whole beach infrastructure. Honestly, instead of coming here for a holiday, I'd rather go to Samara. There's a good beach there. I'm from Samara, so please come. It's a great city. At the same time, Venezuela has fancy resorts, especially on the islands, that look luxurious like the Maldives. But the prices are so high that these resorts are affordable only to the guys from the golf fields. Common people just can't afford it. They most likely have never even heard that such places exist. All this is extremely sad because Venezuela has an unbelievable potential for tourism. The world's highest waterfall, for example, is 
right here. If you thought that it's Niagara Falls, which we'll cover soon in another video, so please subscribe now, then you're wrong. Angel Falls is one kilometer high. Water is sprayed out in tiny bits that form fog. I will leave a link in the description where the waterfall is shot in 368K format. Highly recommended. is in deep jungle and you can only reach it by boat or by plane. There isn't a single tree here that hasn't been struck by one of the frequent lightning storms. Another breathtaking place is Roraima. It looks like a shot from a sci-fi movie. It's also known as the tabletop mountain of Tapeus. It is part of a big plateau that formed 200 million years ago when America and Africa were one continent. Roraima was inaccessible for people for many years. Only the bravest from the Indian tribes sneaked from time to time to what they believed was the sacred terrain. There is a legend about a local Loch Ness monster. It's called Cabrasaurus. Witnesses often describe a Cabrasaurus as a huge snake with a prolonged body five to 30 meters long with the head of a horse or a camel. That's how the remains of a Cabrasaurus look. Though later it was discovered that it was a shark. So you sit peacefully, and suddenly, the electricity is off. In the next episode, I will show you how the most dangerous country lives in complete darkness. We are actively told to sit in the car, like it's dangerous. What happens on the streets at night when the city centre is empty? It's the first time that electricity was shut down in the whole country. Can you imagine what it is to switch off electricity, for example in the whole of Russia? How many days can you survive if there's no water or electricity in a flat? All water pumps are also electric. We could hear gunshots all night long. God knows what kind of gunfight it was. What happens at the Venezuelan border? How families cross the ford by foot, while others protest against the government and the police. Let's go back. I think it's really dangerous. They burnt that truck that's still on the bridge. How does it feel like to fly from a powered down airport? It's like a sauna, blood, sweat and tears. There will be a protest or a breakthrough because people have already been queuing for hours and by looking at this line, they'll be standing here for another 20. This is our new format. Please subscribe to my channel, press like, take part in the contest. Here you will see how people live.